Welcome to this new series of Little Hill Church History Lectures for 2023, entitled Famous or Forgotten. There are many people throughout history in various spheres who've been famous in their generation. But as the years pass, the achievements of these once famous people gradually fade in the collective memory as their tombstones gather moss in the graveyard. Only a few are still remembered. As Isaac Watts puts it in a paraphrase of Psalm 90, Time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its sons away. They fly forgotten as a dream dies at the opening day. The three men, Samuel Shaw, Sir John Hartop and William Carey, whom we'll be considering in this series, are all men who made a mark on their society for good, not only in Leicestershire, but also on a wider stage. However, I would hazard a guess that if I were to ask you which of the three you had heard of, I reckon there would probably only be one, William Carey. The aim of these lectures is to bring the lives of these largely forgotten forefathers to our attention, since they deserve to be remembered for their sterling service in the cause of the gospel. Ultimately, of course, the purpose is not to bring glory to their names, but to glorify the great God they served and to challenge us to walk in their footsteps. Samuel Shaw, the subject of tonight's lecture, was one of the 35 Leicestershire ministers that we heard about in last year's series, who were ejected for their non-conformity after the restoration of King Charles II in 1660. In fact, Shaw was the most famous and celebrated of those ministers in his own day, so I felt that he deserved a lecture all to himself. I hope that you will agree. We'll begin with an outline of the lecture. And all the points begin with P, but some are shorter than others. 1. Shaw's parentage and place of birth. This covers his early years. 2. Shaw, the pastor and preacher. 3. The man of principle. This will deal with his ejection. 4. A pen portrait of Shaw. What he was like as a person. Five, the man of prayer. Six, the plague sufferer. Seven, the pedagogue or school teacher. And eight, by way of conclusion, Shaw's legacy and four lessons from his life for us today. One, parentage and place. Shaw's birth and early background. Samuel Shaw was born in 1635, not in Leicestershire, but just over the county border in Derbyshire, in the ancient town of Repton. Repton prides itself on its long history stretching back to Anglo-Saxon times. But in the late 16th and early 17th centuries, it was famed as the location of Puritan preaching exercises, attended by large numbers of the public. The leading preacher at these exercises was Arthur Hildersham, who would ride the eight and a half miles from Ashby de la Zouche, where he lived and ministered. Perhaps Samuel Shaw's father or grandfather was influenced by this preaching, but whatever the case, Samuel grew up in a godly household where he learnt the things of God. His father, Thomas, was a blacksmith, described as a pious man. And Thomas Shaw had aspirations for his bright son Samuel and sent him to Repton School, which had a reputation of being one of the country's finest. Even today, Repton School is well known, with alumni including Roald Dahl, and Jeremy Clarkson. Samuel would have benefited from the strong pro Protestant ethos and teaching of the school based on the scriptures, as well as gaining an excellent grounding in Latin 
and the other subjects required at the time. A significant number of boys from the school went on to enter the Christian ministry. These included two Staffordshire ministers, Thomas Bladen and Richard Chantry, who were also later ejected, along with Shaw. Richard Chantry became Shaw's lifelong friend, and in fact, Samuel preached Richard's funeral sermon in 1694. And it was said of Samuel and Richard that, quotes, they were born in the same town, educated at the same free school, and afterwards in the same chamber of the same college and university. And Samuel's school days coincided with the turbulent civil war period when battles and skirmishes were raging around the Midlands. Aged 15, Samuel was admitted to St John's College, Cambridge, on the 23rd of December 1650, the year after the execution of Charles I and when Cromwell was in power. Here Samuel gained his BA. And it would have been apparent, even in these early university years, where Samuel's religious and political convictions lay. He was a moderate Presbyterian who wanted reform of the Church of England and he felt called to be a minister of the gospel. These sympathies, along with his obvious spiritual and intellectual gifts, brought him to the notice of those with wealth and power who shared similar sentiments. And the support and patronage of these influential individuals was vital for young ministerial candidates, particularly for poor boys like Shaw. And being admitted to such Puritan gentry networks played an important part in Shaw's history and was the means used by God to provide for him at key stages of his life. Samuel's first post after his graduation from Cambridge in 1656 was as master of the grammar school in Tamworth. His appointment was perhaps due to the recommendation of John Swinfen, a local landowner and Presbyterian politician. And it was quite normal at that time for masters of schools to be ministers of the gospel. Their godly education at university qualified them for both professions. And schools often had an explicitly Christian foundation and educating the young according to biblical principles was regarded as vital. Schoolmasters commonly combine teaching with preaching. And so, alongside his teaching responsibilities in Tamworth, Samuel assisted the local Puritan vicar, Thomas Blake, at whose funeral he delivered an oration in 1657, which was later published. In that address, Shaw, aged only 21 or 22, modestly refers to himself as an infant orator but he was obviously already becoming known in Puritan circles. Two, the pastor and preacher. In August 1657, the 22-year-old Samuel was invited to become curate of Moseley near Bromsgrove in Worcestershire by a member of the local gentry, Colonel Richard Greaves, a Presbyterian who had earlier commanded a regiment in the Parliamentary Army. In Moseley, Shaw worked closely with Thomas Hall, the Presbyterian curate of King's Norton. And you may remember from last year's series that this was the period when the Church of England was being reformed under Cromwell and the Westminster Assembly of Divines. One of the changes being that within the Church of England, bishops were abolished and ordination to the ministry was by means of a Presbyterian classis. Under an Act of Parliament, these classes were set up across the country and consisted of groups of local ministers and lay elders. They met regularly for prayer, preaching and the exercise of church disciplinary matters in their area, with ministers taking turns to act as chairman or moderator. Shaw, being a Derbyshire man, was ordained in January 1658 by the Worksworth classes, 
there not being one in Worcestershire. Other classes operated in the East Midlands, for example in Nottingham, Derby and Chesterfield, but Worksworth seems to have been the most active group, ordaining at least 50 men for the ministry between 1651 and 58, the period covered by their surviving minutes. The setting apart of a man for the Christian ministry, known as ordination, was regarded as a solemn and serious business and was conducted under a detailed procedure laid down by Parliament. It was a rigorous process to ensure that only worthy candidates were admitted to the sacred office. And Samuel appeared before a total of ten different ministers and several elders who examined him on three separate occasions between September 1657 and January 1658. He was required to preach an approbation sermon, which had to be approved for orthodoxy, to give an account of the work of grace upon his soul, supply certificates corroborating his ministerial capabilities, and prove evidence of his skill in Hebrew and Greek, the original biblical languages and his knowledge of divinity. He was given a thesis to argue in Latin, and Shaw was allocated the topic, is the death of an innocent Christ consistent with God being just? On the ordination day itself in Worksworth Church, one of the ministers from the classes, Martin Topham, the Puritan rector of Worksworth, preached the ordination sermon concerning the office and duty of the ministers of Christ. Then, along with two other candidates for ordination, Samuel was required, before the assembled congregation, to answer satisfactorily all the questions set out in the 1646 Parliamentary Ordinance. These questions concerned, quote, his faith in Christ Jesus and his persuasion of the truth of the Reformed religion according to the scriptures. His sincere intentions and ends in desiring to enter into this calling. His resolution to use constant diligence in prayer, reading, meditation, preaching and ministering the sacraments and doing all ministerial duties towards his charge with his whole desire as in the presence of God so as may most further their edification and salvation. His zeal and faithfulness in maintaining the truth of the gospel and purity of the church against error and schism. His care that himself and family may be unblameable and examples to the flock and his full purpose to continue his duty against all trouble and persecution. Prior to the ordination of each man, by prayer and the laying on of hands, by the seven ministers and six elders present, this form of words was used in the presence of the congregation. Thankfully acknowledging the great mercy of God in sending of Jesus Christ for the redemption of his people and for his ascension to the right hand of God the Father and there pouring out his spirit and gifts to men. Apostles, evangelists, prophets, pastors and teachers, for the gathering and building up of his church, and for fitting and inclining this man, Samuel Shaw, to this great work, to beseech him, to fill him with his spirit, whom in his name we set apart to this holy service, to fulfil the work of his ministry in all things, that he may both save himself and the people committed to his charge. Exhortation and a prayer of blessing followed. Samuel Shaw was thus ordained as a minister in the Church of England, not some separate Presbyterian denomination, but the Church of England as it was governed by law in the 1650s. He had made solemn promises before God and the people. And you might wonder why I've gone into such detail about the procedure, but its significance for Samuel Shaw will soon become apparent. So, a snapshot of Samuel at this stage of his life in his early twenties 
shows him already set apart for the work of gospel ministry, having gained valuable pastoral and preaching experience in both Tamworth and Moseley, under the wise guidance of older ministers. In 1657, during his time in Moseley, Samuel had married Jane Poole, the daughter of Ferdinando Poole, the minister at Thrumpton, Nottinghamshire, who was himself ejected for non-conformity in 1662. And that Jane and Samuel had been introduced to each other must surely have been due to the influence of the Puritan gentry patron of Thrumpton, Gervase Piggott, who had served as a captain in the parliamentary armies. For in the following year, 1658, Gervais Piggott was also responsible for Shaw entering the Leicestershire scene when Piggott persuaded Oliver Cromwell that Samuel would be a good candidate for the vacant rectory at Long Watton. And Samuel took possession of the post on the 5th of June, 1658. The village of Long Watton is situated in North West Leicestershire, about four and a half miles from Loughborough and not far from the county boundaries with Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. In the 17th century, Long Watton occupied a strategic location, with the presence nearby of two turnpike roads, the one running from Ashby to Rempston and the other from Derby to London, now the A6. The ancient parish church of All Saints, Long Watton, is situated in a prominent position next to the Long High Street. However, although Shaw's position as rector of Long Watton was confirmed by the Crown in September 1660 after the restoration of the King, the opposition of Sir John Prettyman, the local MP for Leicester, forced Shaw's removal from office in 1661. Prettyman seemed to have had no personal dislike of Shaw, but used his influence with the Lord Chancellor so that his own far less worthy candidate could be inserted in Shaw's place. And though Samuel Shaw ministered in Long Watton for less than three years, he seems to have made a positive impression on his parishioners. Even in a recent book produced by Long Watton Local History, Society, there's a page devoted to Samuel Shaw, headed A Good Minister. And this is quite remarkable in itself. Very few of the Leicestershire ejected ministers are remembered at all. It almost seems that they've been airbrushed out of history. Where they are mentioned, it's often to label them as zealous bigots that the church was glad to see the back of. But this doesn't appear to have been the case with Samuel Shaw. And during Shaw's time in Longwatton, two daughters were born to him and Jane and were baptised in All Saints Church, Francis in November 1658 and Esther in 1660. Samuel also officiated at the marriage of his wife's sister, Mary Poole, to another minister friend, William Cross, in Longwatton Church in 1659. When ministers were ejected from their parishes after the Restoration, on the grounds of conscience, they usually preached a farewell sermon to their congregations. Words of advice and exhortation when they knew that they would not be able to address the people again. Samuel Shaw's farewell sermon is the only one from Leicestershire to have been published. It's included in a volume entitled England's Remembrancer, 1663, a collection of sermons from East Midlands ministers. And these ministers all knew each other well and had close bonds of fellowship in the gospel. Samuel's sermon in the book follows that of his brother-in-law, William Cross, ejected from Beeston in Nottinghamshire. And Samuel chose to preach on the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 1 verse 12. But I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened to me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. And Samuel's sermon is rather less personal than some of the other ones in the collection, perhaps because he'd only 
spent a relatively short time with his people. But his message is a very positive one, as he seeks to encourage his flock to consider how the silencing of the ejected ministers could serve to advance the cause of the gospel. And this approach is characteristic of Shaw, who often emphasises the loving and sovereign wisdom of God, who, quotes overrules everything to the good of his people and stresses how vain are the designs of men and how little to be feared. Thus, Shaw tells his congregation that though it might seem to the contrary, the oppressing and afflicting of the Church of God does frequently fall out to the increase, enlargement and multiplication of it. Quoting the famous saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the Church. He tells his hearers, Every affliction thou hast suffered for Christ shall be as a sparkling jewel to give a luster to thy crown of glory. And Shaw goes on to give various reasons why suffering may work for the furtherance of the gospel, including sufferings will make God's ministers and people better Christians. Ministers trained up in the school of affliction will be more fitted to deal with the infirmities of others. When they're restored to their ministry after the enforced rest, they will have renewed zeal. God's people will be quickened in their prayers, be more united and be forced to study the Bible more seriously when they cannot hear sermons. Professing Christians will value the precious gospel and preaching more when it is restored to them but will witness more to their neighbours when there is no minister available to do it. And thus I beseech you, Christian friends, Shaw urges, declare the great things of the gospel in the way in which you may. Do it now, if ever. Addressing his fellow ministers, Shaw exhorts them to be humbled by their silence, thing, to study their own hearts and seek to profit from the time labouring to be examples of courage, faithfulness and constancy to their flocks. He exclaims, Oh, how good were it to be here, in pulpits, in congregations, if it please God. But we must arise. This is not our rest. And God knows whether our places must again know us any more. In parting, Samuel encourages his congregation to reflect on former truths they've been taught. He urges them to be hard at prayer and not to cease, quotes, till you have prayed us into our liberties in the gospel again. He tells them not to mourn as those with no hope, crying, oh, that God would so bless the church we live in with peace and truth and piety that we, your ministers, may never be missed and our names never be remembered more. And in urging his people to pray for the restoration of the ejected ministers to their congregations, Shaw evidently believed that their suspension would be a temporary one. And although he retained that desire to be part of the national church and had a sense of unity with it, he was not to know that he would never occupy a Church of England pulpit again. And now section three, the man of principle concerning his ejection. And Samuel Shaw is often described as a moderate man who desired to live at peace with others and, as we shall see, was happy to collaborate with godly men in the Church of England after his ejection. However, this is not to say that he was a weak man who compromised on truth. He was a man of principle who stood firm on important issues. A contemporary account relates the story of how Shaw had the opportunity to be restored to his rectory in Longwatton. When some of his former parishioners, who had so little respect for his replacement, Andrew Butler, a man of such poor qualifications and no pastoral experience, that they approached Sir John Prettyman, who'd installed Butler, telling him they'd heard that Butler had given him a pair of coach horses as a bribe to be given the rector's job. 
the parishioners offered Sir John two pairs of horses to get Butler out and put Mr Shaw in again. And Prettyman, persuaded either by this bribe or by the strength of arguments, apparently offered Samuel Shaw his old post back, with the only condition being that he must be reordained by a bishop. And after the Restoration, the Church of England had been returned to its previous constitution and rule by bishops had been reinstated. However, Samuel refused, saying that, quotes, he would not lie to God and man in declaring his, <coughs> excuse me, his Presbyterian ordination invalid. And having heard an account of how thorough that ordination as a Church of England minister was before God and in sight of the congregation, you can appreciate how Samuel could not in conscience satisfy himself to conform and declare that solemn ordination he'd received in Worksworth Church three years earlier had been invalid. Therefore, although Shaw desired and prayed for reinstitution within the Church of England after his ejection, it was not at any cost. And when we hear of his cordial relationships with Anglican clergy and bishops and his willingness to submit himself to the authorities as far as possible, we shouldn't forget that he was prepared to sacrifice his livelihood and calling for the sake of principle. He also continued to associate with non-conforming ministers too, even when the, this was illegal after 1662. One who met with Shaw during this period recounts the many nights a group of them spent in secret religious exercises, when the times were so dangerous that you were more in danger of being arrested for worshipping God with five or six like-minded people than for being drunk or visiting a brothel. The friend describes sometimes being in Samuel's company for a whole night when they had to steal to the place in the dark block out the light and their voices by covering the windows and keeping their them fast shut until, he says, the first daybreak down a chimney has given us notice to be gone. The friend comments, I bless God for such seasons. And where these precious meetings took place, we're not told. They could have been in Leicestershire. There's also mention of Shaw preaching privately in Derbyshire. Four, Shaw's personality, a pen portrait. And at this stage, I think we should try to learn more about the man himself. And it's hard to find anyone with a bad word to say of Samuel Shaw. Everyone from bishops to schoolboys spoke approvingly of his winsome, cheerful personality. Here are just some of the things that were said about him. His temper was affable, his conversation pleasant. He was of a peaceable disposition and was frequently employed in reconciling differences. He had a public and generous spirit and was ready to encourage any good designs. He was given to hospitality and very moderate in his principles. In physical appearance, Shaw was apparently not much to look at. I don't think the periwig helped very much. And he was of little stature, it was said, and his countenance not very promising. He was like another Melanchthon, Luther's assistant, that could not fill a chair with a big look and a portly presence. And when we visited Longwatton Church last summer, we saw this chair, dated 1655, which was only three years before Samuel's arrival. He might well have sat in it. I tried it out for size to see if I could fill it. But despite Samuel's lack of height and plain face, the writer continues, his eye was sparkling and he had a singular tongue. His conversation was described as edifying, friendly and to the point. He was quick with a witty response or a bit of poetry, and he enjoyed innocent fun. However, it was said 
His greatest excellency was in talking of spiritual matters, in praying and preaching. Quotes, in short, then, a mixture of so much learning and humility, wit and judgment, godliness and pleasantness, as are rarely found together, were met in him. He lived beloved and died lamented. And this brings us to five, the man of prayer. And the friend who shared secret fellowship with Samuel said, I bless God for the remembrance of such times and for Mr Shaw at them, whose melting words in prayer I can never forget. He had a most excellent faculty in speaking to God with reverence, humility and a holy awe of his presence, filling his mouth with arguments. By his strength he had power with God. He wept and made supplication. He found him in Bethel, such were our assemblies, the house of God. And there he spake with us. I have heard him for two or three hours together pour out prayer to God, without tautology or vain repetition, with that vigour and fervour and those holy words that imported faith and humble boldness, as has dissolved the whole company into tears. Well, after those descriptions of Samuel's personality and person, let's return to his story. We left him having been thrown out of his pulpit at Longwatton. And we now come to the two things for which Samuel Shaw was most famous in his lifetime, not only in Leicestershire, but also nationally. And the first of these is point six, the plague sufferer. Now, after Samuel was ejected from Longwatton in 1661, he moved to Coates, a small village near Loughborough, the location of a civil war skirmish in 1644. And it seems likely that Shaw went there at the invitation of Sir Christopher Pack, a strong supporter of Oliver Cromwell, who, after the Restoration, had withdrawn to his estate at Coates Hall, afterwards destroyed in a fire. And Shaw later dedicated a book to Christopher Pack, who may well have provided accommodation in Coates for the homeless Shaw, his pregnant wife and two little daughters, Francis and Esther. And Shaw might also have served as Pack's private chaplain. And while in Coates, Samuel and Jane had another daughter, Mary, baptised in February 1662. And the family had lived in Coates for about four years when disaster struck. In the autumn of 1665, some relatives from London came to stay with them to escape the danger of the Great Plague that was to kill nearly 70,000 of London's citizens. However, those visitors must have already been infected with the plague, which then spread to everyone in the household. In Coates. Both Samuel and his wife got the disease at different stages, but not too badly. They nursed each other and then all the sick by themselves. Their house was shut up for three months. No one could visit them and provisions were left on the dill step. Two of their own children, five-year-old Esther and three-year-old Mary, whom Samuel describes as two tender babes, died along with two of their visitors from London, one of whom was Shaw's beloved sister, and a servant. Samuel was forced to bury all five by himself in his own garden. No one would help him. And their own family grief was compounded by the senseless aspersions of some of Samuel's neighbours, who blamed him for introducing plague into their community and suggested that he must be a very great sinner for God to punish him in this way. However, the harrowing experience led him to write the two books for which he is best known. The Voice of One Crying in the Wilderness, 1666, and Emmanuel, 1667. The first of these, written only seven months after the ordeal, contains a sermon preached initially in his own family entitled Welcome to the Plague. 
In it, Samuel is able to trace God's loving, wise and sovereign will in these awful events and even bless God that only three members of his immediate family were called away and the rest were spared. He has been taught the difficult lesson not to place too much affection on any created thing, including his own beloved children. Samuel tells his readers, You will easily believe that I can have no pleasure to rake into the ashes of the dead, nor to revive the taste of that wormwood and gall which was then given me to drink. And yet, I see no reason but that I ought to take pleasure in the pure and holy will of God, which always proceeds by the eternal rules of almighty love and goodness, though the same be executed upon my dearest creature comforts. And Samuel is able to declare with the psalmist, in very faithfulness hast thou afflicted me, because in the day of affliction he has been brought to rest in the very nature of God, whose Quotes, goodwill towards his children is a solid, wise and holy disposition, infinitely unlike to our human affections. He continues, The greatest prosperity in the world is no further good than as it tends to make us partakers of God, and the greatest affliction may thus be really good also. My design is to justify and glorify infinite wisdom, righteousness, goodness and holiness before all men. O oh, blessed God, who makes a seeming dungeon to be indeed a wine cellar, who brings his poor people into a wilderness on set purpose there to speak comfortably to them. Be of good cheer, O oh my soul, he has taken away nothing but what he gave. And Samuel is not only resigning himself to God's will, but arguing that we should love God's will and take pleasure in it because it is ultimately for our good. It's a powerful and challenging lesson for us all. A welcome to the plague had a big effect on many who read it, and it was used by God to bring Shaw to the attention of some in high places as we shall see. 7. The Pedagogue or School Teacher Samuel, Jane and their one surviving daughter, Frances, aged eight, moved at the end of the following year, 1666, to Ashby de la Zouche, about 14 miles from Coates, at the invitation of one of the leading citizens, Sir Edward Abney of Willersley Hall, who was sympathetic to nonconformists. Other children were born to Samuel and his wife in Ashby and baptised in the parish church. Samuel in 1666, Ferdinando in 1674 and Jane. And if you've listened to some of my previous lectures, you will know that Ashby was the main centre of Puritanism in Leicestershire in the late 16th and early 17th centuries largely due to Henry Hastings, 3rd Earl of Huntingdon, Lord of the Manor who lived in Ashby Castle, who was known as the Puritan Earl. His great desire was to make Reformation truth known in the town and in the county at large. As part of this design, he had invited to Ashby many godly preachers, notably Anthony Gilby and Arthur Hildersham to protected them and given them financial support. And the influence of more than 70 years of gospel preaching in Ashby was still in evidence among many of the townspeople at the time of the Restoration in the 1660s. A hundred years earlier, in 1567, the third Earl had established a grammar school in Ashby with the aim of providing a godly education for local boys. Scripture teaching and catechising formed an important part of the curriculum. And it was specified that the master of the school must be of, quotes, sound religion and of honest conversation and manners, who should labour to train up his scholars in true religion and in godly life 
and should be learned and able to teach the Latin tongue. This school had flourished in its earlier years, especially under the headship of the Puritan John Brinsley from 1599 to 1617, who worked closely with Arthur Hildersham. And a good number of the school pupils went on to university and became preachers of the gospel. However, by the 1660s, the school had fallen on hard times. Many of its buildings had been destroyed during the Civil War, and more recently there had been a dispute over financial mismanagement. Thus it was reported that, quote, the revenue was then small, and the school buildings, those few there were, quite out of repair, and numbers of scholars few. But in the providence of God, the ideal candidate to take on the challenge of improving this sad state of affairs was already living in the town and out of a job. From 1666, for over two years, the school trustees were able to observe Samuel Shaw's faithful and godly life every day at close hand and as he worshipped with them in the parish church. They knew of Shaw's academic excellence and that he'd already had experience of school teaching in Tamworth. As the historian of Ashby Grammar School puts it, the school trustees were indeed fortunate to find in their midst a man of outstanding qualifications and exemplary character, who was able and willing to tackle the very considerable task of reviving the grammar school. And it was clearly a sense of God's calling that led Samuel Shaw to accept the position of master of Ashby School, rather than a financial motivation. The trustees could only afford to offer him an annual salary of £18, 13 shillings and sixpence, along with free occupation of the schoolhouse. And this seems a pittance compared to the £150 a year he had received as rector of Long Watton. And Shaw became the schoolmaster of Ashby in early 1669, aged 34, and was to remain in that position for the next 25 years. And he became the most successful and famous headmaster in the school's long history. But there was a fundamental problem to be overcome before Shaw could even be appointed. Legally, schoolmasters required a licence to teach which they could only obtain by subscribing to the 1662 Act of Uniformity, in the same way as parish ministers. And Samuel Shaw had been ejected as a minister for non-subscription because his conscience would not allow him to accept reordination by a bishop. It looked like an unsolvable impasse. However, God wonderfully arranged matters so that Samuel could get the required licence without having to compromise his conscience. Samuel's reputation as a writer and godly man was becoming widespread, and one influential advi uh, admirer, Lord Conway, took up Samuel's case with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Gilbert Sheldon, no lover of nonconformity. And without Samuel having to lift a finger, the Archbishop granted him a licence to teach school anywhere in his whole province. The Archbishop asked him to subscribe to some of the clauses of the Act, but allowed him an exemption from the province, sorry, provision about reordination. School teachers were perhaps not treated as stringently as parish ministers, but even so, a modified subscription like Shaw's would have been a fairly unusual arrangement. And Samuel also needed a licence to teach from the bishop of his local diocese, William Fuller, Bishop of Lincoln. So Samuel asked a friend to present his application to the bishop on his behalf. And this friend put a copy of Shaw's book about the plague in the bishop's hands to prove Samuel's real worth. And as he read the book, the bishop Quotes, was so impressed with the piety, peaceableness, humility and learning of Shaw, which shone through its pages, that he issued Shaw with a licence, 
in which he was allowed to specify his own terms of subscription. The bishop added that he was glad to have so worthy a man in his diocese upon any terms. The bishop also asked for another of Shaw's books to be sent to him. Shaw later corresponded with Fuller's successor as Bishop of Lincoln, Thomas Barlow, who also admired Shaw's writings and signed himself your affectionate friend and brother. And though he had no idea of this at the time of writing, Shaw's account of God's mercy to him in the afflictions of the plague was to be the means God used to open doors to a new sphere of ministry and blessing, as well as preparing him for that ministry. And so Samuel Shaw commenced the daunting task of restoring Ashby Grammar School. And he began with the finances and buildings. And by his diligence, he soon got the salary augmented, not only for himself, but all succeeding schoolmasters. This was necessary if the school was to attract and retain teachers of a high calibre, essential for the quality of the education being delivered. Shaw begged money from his many local gentry friends for the building work required. And it was not long before new school premises close to the old ones were provided, along with a schoolhouse and a gallery for the pupils in the church when they attended services each Sunday. The school historian comments that this rebuilding should have been accomplished without funds from the school estate is a great tribute both to the generosity of the old boys and parents of the day and to the persuasive personality, enthusiasm and practical ability of Mr Shaw himself. And after securing the buildings and finances of the school, Shaw turned to the teaching and curriculum of the pupils. And it was said that his piety, learning and disposition soon raised the reputation of his school above any in the surrounding area and the number of pupils rapidly grew. And he often had more than 160 boys in his charge and he required the aid of one or two assistant teachers. His house and the town were continually full of boarders from London and other distant parts of the kingdom, which was very good for local trade. The boys received an excellent education due to his instruction, and many went on to become lawyers, doctors and church ministers in both the Church of England and nonconformist chapels. However, Shaw did not restrict entry to wealthy gentlemen's sons. He was generous in his charity, and it was reported that he, quotes, freely taught poor children, where he saw in them a disposition to learning, and afterwards procured them assistance to perfect their studies at the university. And Shaw never forgot his own humble beginnings as a blacksmith's son and his debt to God's free grace. So what was Shaw's method and aim in this teaching and how did he achieve this success in the school? You could say that his mission statement was this. Quotes, he endeavoured to make the youth that were under his care in love with piety or godliness and to principle them in religion at an early age by his good advice and allure or attract them to it by his good example. Shaw was really putting into practice Proverbs 22, verse 8. Train up a child in the way that he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. He didn't do this, apparently, by a harsh authoritarianism, which wasn't uncommon at the time, but by seeking to inspire and enthuse them. We never forget teachers with such gifts, do we? And Shaw's temper was described as affable, his conversation pleasant and amusing, his method of teaching winning and easy, and that he had great skill in finding out and suiting himself to the tempers of boys. And this was illustrated by two Christmas entertainments which he wrote for the boys to perform. To us, they seem quite dull, but I think the boys would have enjoyed acting out the extreme stereotypical characters 
and the verbal sparring. And Shaw wasn't above pointing, um, poking a bit of gentle fun at his own expense with the lampooning of a ridiculous man, Mr Spruce, who, like Shaw himself, followed the current fashion of wearing a periwig. Shaw's moderate principles were shown in the way he maintained a friendly relationship with the Church of England, especially with the Minister of St Helens, Alexander Jones. And it was not until the passing of the Toleration Act of 1689, on the accession of William and Mary, which gave more liberty to dissenters, that he licensed his school for a place of religious worship and commenced preaching there. But Shaw deliberately arranged the times of his own service not to clash with the services in the parish church and always attended those public services himself, leading all his pupils and his family to their allotted places in the church gallery, greatly swelling the numbers in the congregation. So finally, by way of conclusion, Shaw's legacy and lessons for us. Samuel Shaw died in Ashby, age 60, on the 22nd of January, 1696, and was buried there two days later. His brother-in-law, William Cross, preached his funeral sermon. Shaw was survived by his dear and faithful wife of nearly 40 years, his two married daughters, Francis and Jane, and his two sons, Samuel and Ferdinando. And Ferdinando went on to become minister of Friargate Presbyterian Meeting in Derby. In his will, Samuel declared, I bequeath my soul into the hands of Almighty God, my Heavenly Father, trusting to be accepted of him through the righteousness and mediation of Jesus Christ alone. And Samuel is mentioned in various history books about Ashby, and in the local museum. Ashby Congregational Church is said to date back to Shaw's preaching around 1675, but uh, I'd like to see the evidence for this. The current Ashby School sadly knows nothing about Shaw and now follows very different principles. But there are several lessons for us today from the life of Samuel Shaw. One, Appreciate the real value of a godly character and example. Of sure it was written, quotes, he endeavoured to make the youth that were under his care in love with godliness and attract them to it by his good example. C.H. Spurgeon wrote, for real usefulness, graces are better than gifts. As the man is, so is his work. If we would do better, we must be better. And John MacArthur has said, A leader's effectiveness is always bound up in his character. It is the pastor's example that ultimately lends credibility to his message. Two, do not underestimate the importance of teaching children the things of God from an early age. Dedicated and gifted teachers can have an enormous impact on the lives of generations of children under their care, as Samuel did. We should thank God for those who taught us in our youth, at home, church and school. Three, learn to admire the sovereign wisdom of God, who overrules everything in his purposes to the good of his people. When God shuts one door, he opens another. Our past experiences are never wasted. Samuel's parish ministry was cut short, but he was being prepared for another, even more fruitful form of ministry to children. Four, strive to rejoice in the goodness and wisdom of God. Referring to the time of the plague, Samuel wrote, I can remember how my soul was overpowered, yea, and almost ravished with the goodness, holiness, and perfection of the will of God 
and verily judged it my happiness and perfection, as well as my duty, to comply cheerfully with it and be moulded into it. God enabled me to converse with his love and his mercy in the midst of his chastening, to see his shining and smiling face through this dark cloud. Yea, kept up clear and steady persuasions in my soul that I was beloved of him, though afflicted by him. <laughs>